Today we're going to spend about 45 minutes talking through using the bio-unified orthotic in pronation and related injury. So uh, we'll start off. So this is the bio-unified. You see here there's two different um, firmnesses or densities of material. And let's have a quick look at it before we uh, start off talking through it. So and aren't there enough prefabs already available? Um, what's wrong with their current choice of possibly hundreds of different prefabs on the market? Uh, Sometimes it's not about trying to bro break something and then fix it. Sometimes it's about starting again and making something better. Um, I've prescribed almost probably more than 10,000 pairs of orthotics in my, in my career, and not many of those have been prefabs. And, and there's a reason for that. There's issues with prefabricated appliances. So what are the additional difficulties with prefabricated um, foot orthoses? And I've got a list here. The first thing is there's advice to rely on some pillage on neutral theory. There's impingement of first rate function. This is all possibly is there's such a variety of prefabs out there. Uh, limitation to shell shape modifications, limitations to modifications to increase pronation or supination moments. Today, obviously, we're focusing more on the pronation ones. Bulk and shoe fit issues, especially when modifications have been added. Comfort and poor durability. Now, I understand there is a lot of prefabs out there, and there'll be a limitation to them in some perspective or some or one of these. So what's different about the bio-unified? Well, it's designed by the unified theory of foot function principles with a view to reducing or abolishing the traditional limitations of prefabricated orthoses. So, so what we did was we actually went through this list, looked at the bad points and saw if we could either reduce them or get rid of them altogether and make prefabricated orthoses a, a more viable option for increasing in clinical use. So that's a brief recap on the theory we used to design these, uh, the unified theory of foot function. So the unified theory principle is that the three historic common podiatric theories may have different historical perspectives but similar orthotic prescription outcomes. So back in 2003 when we started to publish this theory, we realised that with the development of podiatric biomechanics and orthotic management, diverse theories of application had evolved. This led to perplexity in clinical and educational settings. Um, so it is what theory do you choose? Um, what part of the theory do you use? Uh, what is their prescription methodology? Do they disagree with each other? Do they agree with each other? And it's easy maybe as a postgrad to, to sit there and look at it and find this interesting. But if you imagine, and I'm sure we've all been there, as an undergraduate, it gets very confusing when there's more than one theory and they appear, for some reason, to disagree with each other. And yet you'll go to a clinic and people will be using bits and pieces of theories or say they're very dogmatic in one um, and disagree with someone who sees the patient next. So Lee recognised this in a, a superb paper back in 2001. They said, with this diverse application, uh, we need to keep an open, critical, questioning mind. <sighs> really, right now, we're in a bit of a paradigm crisis um, where we have many different theories coming up and, and, and looking sometimes quite ridiculous. But in a paradigm crisis, all ideas are on the table. And it's now we get the interesting times. Now, we can spend a lot of time again. We, we've done this a lot in many conferences, going through how all the different theories and podiatry and foot functions agree with each other. I mean, incredibly negative again. Yeah, but all we can try to be positive and unify what's gone before. And that's where the theory came from. This is a wonderful um, paragraph with some amazing grammar by Joshua Reynolds, which explains why it's important to, to unify um, what's gone before. Um, I'll let you read that rather than read through it. Because if we get to unify a theory, um, have a perspective on foot function which works for us, um, but we can then use that. We can then teach that maybe without going through all the other theories that lead up to it. And these are the three main podiatric theories we have the foot morphology theory, the sagittal plane facilitation theory, and the tissue stress theory. They all have different criteria for normalcy. And again, and this was published back in 2009 by me and Lawrence Bevan and Jatma. If you're trying to teach this and understand this, the idea there's three different ways the foot can work um, doesn't make much sense. You know, there's two different ways of casting, even if casting is actually important. And the aims of the orthotics you're going to prescribe, even though there's no actual orthotic prescription available for these theories, there's no cookbook available for us to follow, seem to disagree with each other. However, when you get to the actual real nitty gritty with what the orthotics are doing, there's a common thread. And that common thread is, 
they all appear to reduce the first ray dorsal flexion moment by some perspective, some amount, and or reduce the pronation moment. Maybe in different amounts, different ratios, if you like, but they still have the same prescription protocol. Reduce the amount of the first ray is being impinged and reduce the amount of pronation. So what we've done with designing the prefabricated orthotic, the bio-unified, is we've taken that into account. We thought we want orthotic to be able to do is reduce the first rate dorsiflation moment while reducing the pronation moment. Now remember, although I'm putting forward the unified theory of foot function as a simplified method of understanding foot function and linking it into gait and tying it into core stability work, and you'll see in a minute um, other gait theories, that all models are wrong. You know, this is another model of foot function used to understand what we're seeing in clinic. But the practical question is how wrong do they have to be not to be useful? You know, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. And then you get to pick your model and you get to think, well, how do I want to work in clinic? And the question which is coming up more and more again, which I, I addressed in 2018 uh, in this publication here, is, is the most popular model, which is still thought to be some change on neutral model, still the most useful? You know, is it still worth basing our prefabs on or any orthotic therapy on the sub joint neutral position when there is so much criticism it's in the overpowering critical research and that's where we get into the historical inaccuracies with how we've taken dr root's theories on do we really want to prescribe a prefab and orthotic based and limited to sub joint neutral theory and how it's been applied for example four degree rear foot posting now is the most classic thing you'll hear balancing the forefoot to the rear foot the subtalar joint neutral position axis all this do we want to limit ourselves to that and this is a discussion for another day however it's important to recognize that we don't have to stick to subtalar joint neutral theory um, because if we don't recognize it as a clinical fiction clinical fiction meaning it's it's basically not not true um it works but not in the way we thought it would work for example as the acceptance of fiction as fact it results in practitioner resistance to change and inability to look outside of the established theory this can lead to stagnation and a slow development of alternative ideas so the bio unified this new prefab is not based on some sort of theory and has no relation to it in either gait or static posture so we can stop limiting ourselves to historic theories which may not be actually relevant to what we are trying to do every day instead we get this sort of fourth line here this fourth thing here i mean this is 2009 we published this in jabna um so this is quite historic now as well but basically what the foot does it functions within the parameter of the dynamic walking theory which i'll talk to you about in a second it acts as a rocker and will allow normal time of internal external leg rotation that's all the foot does Casting is not essential to this theory, but may aid in comfort, aid in comfort and fit. Modifications can be made at casting to aid in applying the correct forces to the foot. You'll see some of this over here, of course, we're unifying what's gone before. Yeah. Whether via a cast or a prefab, emphasis is placed upon comfort and avoiding a high arch appliance, which could impinge on first rate function, which is an increase of first rate dorsiflation moment. What's the orthotic aim? to reduce abnormal pronation or supination moment while offloading the injured structure and facilitating first ray function. Let's just recap dynamic walking theory because it links into how this, this orthotic is being designed and how it can be used. So in undergraduate education you may have been taught a general gait theory and it may have been the six determinants of gait theory and you've heard the pendulum or dynamic walking theory uh, i was certainly taught the first one now i don't want to spend too much time going into these i could spend a long while talking about these because they are fascinating um <laughs> they handled very differently um, to foot function and podiatric theory and none of those three theories mention podiatry in fact some of them don't really even mention the foot um, gates not owned by us and it's sometimes really nice and interesting to read about these theories that aren't driven by any kind of commercial interest just by academic research um, which is what this is over here is about i'm, I'm not insane um, i'm four years into a, a phd on um, gate analysis um, and methods of assessment um, in clinic um, and when we tie into other professions and we look at how they assess gate and they think of gate some very interesting things come out i mean the six determinants of gait theory which is what you were probably taught and pelvic rotation pelvis level um, knee flexion in gait ankle dorsal flexion in gait um, has now been discredited in general in, in the academic population the inverted pendulum theory um, which we talk about so here you have to imagine and i'm, I'm sorry with a, with a webinar i can't 
move my hands and show you and walk up down the room and demonstrate things that I'd love to be doing right now. Um, but the invented pendulum, um, imagine a clock with a pendulum dangling down beneath it and then turning it upside down uh, where your foot stays on the floor and your body sort of pendulum rotates over the top of it. And that's the theory which is talked about quite a lot, but that's been classed as incomplete. And there's a reason for that in a second. The dynamic walking theory by Q and Donnellan is one which ties very well into what we're seeing now and into kinematic data as well. So what's the main principle of the dynamic walking theory? Well, it agrees with the inverted pendulum theory. So it agrees that your foot lands on the floor and your body rotates over the top of it like an inverted pendulum. But there's a problem with this theory, the inverted pendulum theory. And it's that if all energy is actually created, if you like, by the pendulum rotation of the body above the foot, what happens when there's two feet on the floor? Nothing's swinging, nothing's moving. Why, why don't we stop? Why do we keep moving? What Q and Donald have done here is they've talked about energy return from other structures which keep our, preserve our progression, they keep us going forward. Uh, they've talked about energy return from an extended hip, stored energy in the calf, yeah, and knee flexion at contact. There's three ways by which we just keep ourselves progressing forward. And so basically that negates the sort of the breaking moment of our foot hitting the floor is negated by the anterior force uh, of those structures. Now, that sounds really good and it works very well. Theoretically, this theory is, is the best we have for how the, how the lower limb works, but it's not complete. And it's not complete because the publication does not include the foot ankle and how it works. It also doesn't include the upper limb spinal engine, which is not going to be reviewed here, but it's an essential part in gait. So what we can do is we can actually complete the dynamic walking theory distally from a foot perspective by seeing if the unified foot theory of your function fits in to the dynamic walking theory. And it does very well. Hugh and Donnan recognise the foot basically works as a section of a wheel, a rocker, yeah, that lets the foot hit the floor, rotate over it, yeah, inverted pendulum, in the body swinging above the planted foot, and get adequate hip extension. Yeah, while doing that with this hip extension, storing energy, releasing energy, yeah, with the Achilles complex, you know, storing energy, releasing energy, and your knee flexion and contact, stopping the breaking moment and keeping that preservation of progression. So what we're looking at here is, can we add that to our unified foot function theory? And yeah, it works really, really well. Uh, and as like Perry have done for years, we talk about the foot letting the body rotate over the top of it while coping with this internal and external rotation of the leg, which occurs. So let's do a very quick revision slide of the unified theory. Uh, I've presented this many times. It's been in the literature for ages. So I'll go through it. Um, I'll talk through it in relation to linking the upper limb above it. Then I'm going to talk about how that links into the, how the bio-unified has been designed and then how it can be modified and made to let the body work correctly in, in, in gait and posture. Can we walk? The first thing that happens from a foot up perspective is we rock over our heel. That's the first rocker. That rocking over the heel, uh, typically this anterior fires and stops our foot from dropping, from slapping on the floor. It also pulls our knee into flexion. This is this knee flexion we talk about with Kiel and Donlan, and that stops our breaking moment, if you like, and keeps our preservation of progression forward. So we rock over our heel, that's the first thing that lets us do this. At this time, at contact phase, our leg is internally rotating. Now, with internal rotation, we have pronation. And so this pronation occurs to let the leg internally rotate while our foot's on the floor in this closed connected chain. Now, with foot pronation, our arch gets lower, and our arch gets longer. And this lower, longer arch means any structure that goes from the back to the front of the foot, distal to proximal, becomes tighter because origin insertion is getting further apart. We call this the reverse windlass mechanism. So we hit the floor, our first rock, and we rock over the heel. Our leg internally rotates and our foot pronates. Our arch becomes lower, our arch becomes longer, and our plantar fascia and plantar ligaments become tighter now because the origin insertion gets further apart and that tightness gives this longitudinal compressive force through the convex and concave joints of the arch what does that mean it means basically your foot becomes close packed you get congruent stability and that's the stability you need for your heel to be pulled off the floor so people sometimes say we're not looking at this by actual theory of the metatarsal joint anymore um, which um, nester has quite nicely proven doesn't exist, is the monoaxial joint across the midfoot. How do we get this stability we need for heel lift? How come when our foot's lifted off the floor, it's unstable, it's floppy, we can move our mid joints and 
toss them to toss the joints wherever we want to. Yet as soon as we stand up and the normal foot is, there's this wonderful arch which doesn't collapse. It's this reverse witness mechanism. So with pronation, with contact, with normal pronation, her arch becomes lower and longer, our plantar fascia gets tighter, and our plantar ligaments. And that applies this compressive force through our midfoot. Now, while this compressive force is giving us our stability we need, we're rocking over our second rocker, the ankle, which is where this magic 10 degrees comes from. We hear everyone talk about of ankle dorsiflexion we require. Here, we are now having to cope with our leg externally rotating. So for normal feet and legs, our leg begins to externally rotate from mid stance on, sometimes heel lift, sometimes a little bit earlier. And that means our foot has to resupinate. Now with this resupination, our arch begins to raise. Now think about this reverse windlass again. Our arch has got lower and longer, our plantar fascia is tight and our foot is, is, is close packed, if you like, our foot is stable. However, just as our heel gets lifted off the floor, there's a chance that we could lose a lot of this tightness in our fascia because we are resupinating. Our arch is beginning to raise. We're resupinating because our leg is externally rotating. We need to keep stability in the foot, otherwise it'll collapse. It'll get lower at this time. Um, and it can't do that. That's pronation. And we should be resupinating. And it does this via the third digits, mostly the big toe joint, the windless mechanism. So as our heel gets lifted off the floor, our big toe joint gets pushed up and that winds the windless. And by winding the windless, pushes the arch up, keeps our tension in the fascia and lets our big toe joint rotate, dorsiflex, and with that of course we then get normal hip extension. So let's just tie that into the dynamic walking theory. So our leg has to hit the floor, our leg has to then let our whole body, has to dorsiflex if you like, over the whole of the foot while it internally and externally rotates. Our foot has to let that happen. And it does it via the three rockers, it does it via pronation and supination. In the middle of all that, the pronation gives the foot the stability it requires normal pronation, this is of course, by this reverse windlass allowing this compression force across the midfoot. And it keeps that tension in the fascia through supination via the windlass mechanism as our heel gets pulled off the floor, our big toe joint gets pushed up, winds the windlass and maintains its stability. So that's a unified theory of foot functioning gait combined with Q and Donnellan's. Now, by doing that, we now have a, a model. Remember, all models are wrong, but some are useful on how we are walking. And if we have that model, we now have something to aim for with our bio-unified orthotomy. So an ideal prefabricated orthosis would aim to reduce the first rate dorsiflexion moment. So in layman's terms, if I was talking to a patient, I'd be saying here, I want to let your first ray drop. But when you walk, you don't appear to be using your, your, your big toe to walk very well, whatever compensation process we're looking at. I need that first ray to drop. And by doing so, we'll let that first ray rotate and be able to take weight through the third rocker and reduce the pronation moment to improve gait and take stress off the injured structure, allowing normal internal external leg rotation and the three rockers. Now we need that to happen whilst not actually impinging on the first ray. Although I'm going to be aiming to offload the first ray and, and say lamer's terms let it drop, I need to make sure I'm not actually countering that with a high arched appliance or even a medium arched appliance in a low arched foot. I don't have a shell shed that's easy to modify for both support and comfort. I want to have modification to increase pronation moments by a lot or a little. I want a choice. I don't want to have to be limited to two or three degrees or have to put on great big wedges of 12 or 15 degrees. I want it to be low bulk. I want to have modifications to add to that without adding to the bulk. I don't want it to weigh down or fall apart quickly. So what's different? So the first thing that's different between this and most other prefabs you'll see on a mark or any others that we're aware of is the first rate groove or Dell. You can see on the picture here, and that first rate Dell, it's between three and four mil down here. And it's a full width appliance. Now that's the important part here and, and one of the reasons we designed it this way. By being a full width appliance, it means that you can have an orthotic push not move medially in the shoe. Anyone out there listening to this who has ever cut the first ray out of an orthotic or prescribed an orthotic with a first ray cut out will know that quite often that orthotic moves medially in the shoe. So you don't get a first ray cut out at all, you actually get a fifth ray cut out and you still get impingement on the first ray. By keeping the orthotic full width and allowing this first ray groove, you reduce the dorsiflexion moments on the first ray while keeping the orthotic stable, fixed, firm in the shoe and it won't move medially. And let's just look at this model 
on why we have to let the first rate drop because theoretically and this was shown by Rukis um, back in the 1990s and then, then um, by myself and Bevan in the 2000s that pronation or any wedge at all which pushes the first rate up reduces the ability of your hallux to dorsiflate and, and the model is that of course the end of the first mate is quite large and the corresponding aspect of hallux is quite small yep. so and if you don't get this translation initially you don't get the rotation so anything which pushes your first rate up will stop that translation and by doing so stop the rotation so that's a functional limitation of hallux dorsiflexion given something given this first arthritic joint you've just functionally limited you see this on your own foot if you just take your foot and push your first ray up you'll feel the hallux will immediately just reduce its range of motion drastically into dorsiflexion so a big lump of plastic eva poron whatever you're trying to use to so-called reduce pronation pushing up under the first ray complex this blue bit here will just reduce hallux dorsiflexion now this is one of our main concerns in orthotic prescription because if you push the first ray up like that and you make someone walk differently their pain may get better and it's not because they're walking better it's because they're walking worse but they're walking differently and offloading that structure when we even orthotic we want to reduce pronation moments while letting the foot work better in cure of donlan's dynamic walking theory allowing the hip to extend still you know allowing the foot to pronate and supinate at the correct timings we don't want to make someone just walk worse because the long-term effect of that of course is adverse effects elsewhere I'm just going to go back a few slides here to show again that with that first ray del groove, first ray groove here, yeah, we can reduce the, the chances of that first ray being pushed up, which would impinge on our first ray function. Okay. What else is different? Let's switching through these slides here. The next thing is the Unified comes with some Mosai additions in the pack. So every BioUnified comes with a pack of additions you can add on, and the Mosai is one of them. Now, the idea of the Mosai, which I'm going to go through now, is to apply these supination moments to reduce your pronation yep, optimally. So here's a nice hemi post, one sided post. These here are the Mosai posts, cut it at a bleak angle here. Okay, so why and what's a Mosai? So a Mosai stands for medial oblique shell inclination and uh, we designed it uh, clinically um, down in my clinic in costume we had patients who were coming in who were very pronated and we were trying to put lots of wedging on the foot <laughs> lots of wedging we see a lot of um, positive tender dysfunctions at like quiet flat foot we have co close work relationships with the orthopedic team um, and we we're getting up to 15 degrees on, on the rear foot post people of course slide laterally off them and i had a patient come in one time and i was struggling to, to reduce their pronation adequately and i took another cast on that cast i just drew the position of the axis went in the lab i don't know why i drew it on there and i literally just took a normal hemi post off one side in post off reheated the shell and stuck it back on at an oblique angle following the axis and i stood the patient on the orthotic and they immediately resupated standing on it it was the same 15 degrees but the application of the force was in a different direction. Now that led to publications, first of all in podiatry now in the UK, then later on in JAPMA, and that's the reference here, where we realized that in patients who have this medial subtotal on axis, if we line the actual wedging, the posting up with the axis, we appear to be able to apply more force yeah, to reduce pronation moments and less force shearing the patient actually off off the shell i'm going to show you a few slides on that now because here are the two historic choices um, to decrease pronation moments via an orthotic the first one here if that's just a stuck on six degree rear foot post this one here is a medial heel sky um, i will just mention here and i'll show you again later on one of the reasons we don't like giving total posting under an orthotic is you're, you're stuck with symmetry um, if you wanted to give someone uh, if someone came in with a, a flat foot on one side, a quiet flat foot, let's say, and not on the other side, you might want to put six, eight, ten degrees of wedging underneath the side with the with the with the condition. Well, you put it on there, and not only are you going to apply a, a supination moment rather wedge, but you're going to give a nice, well, not nice, probably an unwanted heel raise. And that's one of the issues with total rear foot posts. I'll come to that later on. You don't get that, of course, with a scythe. Yeah, where the heel still sits at the same level as the other side. But they are two historic choices for rear foot 
application of, of supernatia moments. Now, this is when we get into the mosaic, because that red circle there, that's the, that's the sky in there. You can see that lines up with the yellow line. Now, the yellow line is simply parallel to the edge of the orthotic shell. That's how skies and rear postings are applied. But the white arrow here is the patient's axis. So the axis is pushing this way, the hinge of the subtalar joint, if you like, what you're going to rotate around if you apply a force underneath there, is in this direction. But we're trying to rotate the foot around that direction. Let's have a quick recap of the subtalar joint axis before we move on. I'm not sure how many of you out there have, 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 are into axis position, but basically this is an axis down the middle of the foot here. Yeah, this is so-called normal axis. If I were to push up on this side here, Imagine I had my thumb and actually pushed up on this side of the foot. I would invert this foot, I'd supinate it. If I had to push up on the lateral side of this, this line here, which is the subtalar axis, I'd pronate the foot. I'd make a moment to increase the pronation moments by pushing up on this side here. If I pushed up on the bit in the middle, I wouldn't pronate or supinate the foot. That's the axis, that's the hinge, that's the bit in the middle. So what we want to do with an orthotic to reduce pronation is push up on the green bit. You wanted an orthotic to increase your pronation, you push up on this side here. So push up on the green side, you increase your supination, raise the arch, blue side, increase your pronation, lower the arch. So what are orthoses to reduce pronation? We want to push up on the medial side of the axis here. But what if we have a medial subtalar joint axis? And the axis has gone over this position here. Just by standing up, this foot's going to have a large amount of ground reaction force applying a pronation moment to the axis and a small amount, a very small amount applying a supination moment. Our orthotic needs to push up under this part here to reduce pronation. So here's a foot. You have a classic foot with a subtalar joint axis. Just by standing up, this, this is the axis position pointing over here. You have this small moment under here reducing pronation and this large one here increasing pronation. Now imagine doing the supination resistance test on this foot and getting your fingers underneath this part of the foot here and trying to resupinate that foot. That foot's going to have a whole load of pronation moments going on. This is when we start looking at things like subtalar joint neutral theory. We look at that foot, we think about our old fashioned prescription protocols, we think about putting a two, four, or six degree wedge under there. Do we really think a four degree wedge under a foot like this is going to reduce pronation moments optimally? Enough to cause any improvement. It's a bit of like some of the cluster migraines and aspirin. Now, it's in the right direction, yeah, it might help a little bit, but it's not optimally what's needed. Here's another couple of feet with different axis positions here. You see it is a slightly medial axis, that anterior neck of the talus is pointing just medial to the hallux, so likely to be over the toe to be, to be a normal axis. On this side here, with this subtalar joint axis is more medial. This is an adult acquired flat foot again, yep. So you see just by standing up on this foot, there's a large moment here, pronating the foot, and a small moment here, supinating the foot. So the net moment here is going to be into pronation. And pain shown in 2003, the more medial the axis, the greater force required to resupinate the subtalar joint. So let's go back to this slide. Yeah, stay with me here, because I know this is getting a little bit, you've got some trigonometry slides coming up. Um, but what we have here is, is, is another look at that slide again with the red semicircle here, oval here, sorry, shows that the position of this medial heel sky is trying to push the foot into supination around here. But the axis is there. The rotation point is there. So basically what this means is we're not pushing with the axis. We're pushing against it. We reduce, therefore, application. Yeah, and we create a force we don't want, sliding the patient off the shell. Let's have a look at this in, in, again. This, this idea of this force of sliding off the shell. If you have two people of the same strength trying to move this door, you've got this man pushing this way and this man pushing this way. They have the same strength, they have the same weight, they're applying the same force. Yeah, but the door's going to move this way. It's going to rotate this way because this man here only has one direction of force. This one here has two. So he loses the Fx force, which is the one we want to walk around, the hinge of the door there. So Fy, his hand literally slides up the door while he's trying to push it, and the door goes this way. Now that, and bear with me on this slide here, 
is what happens when we don't try to line our wedging up with the axis. So here, what we're looking at here is the back of the calcaneum. So imagine looking at the back of a shoe and then cutting it. Yeah, you're looking at the back of the shoe, back of the heel. That's the axis, it's move medial. It's not in the middle, it's move medial. Okay, so we want to now push this foot up on the medial side of the axis here to reduce this pronation moment. But rather than push up, we push over. Why are we pushing over? Because the wedging, our posting, our, our sky is not lined up with the axis. And for that reason, although we do apply some force in the FY, the up direction to reduce pronation, we also apply force in the FX. We could lose, and there's some there's numbers taken from the chapter paper, about 13% of force from up to over. But you know that doesn't disappear, that force. Yet it pushes the patient off the orthotic. What we want is to actually line our posting, our wedging up with this axis here, not with the edge of the shell. I want to push this way. That's what we want, on all FY force, all upward force. So we can get a larger post without any slip off and we get a greater and more optimal application of this, this supination moment to reduce pronation. And that's how the mosaic came about. Now these lines are only drawn on here to show you um, sort of the console here. The idea is the axis is over here and the wedging is over there. So by applying the mosaic to a prefab, you're applying forces optimally, you're applying possibly large posting on there without getting people to slide off. And that comes into the discomfort side without getting this lateral irritation. Of course, you can make these custom, yeah, but now we can get it via bi unified orthoses too. So here's the main difference the Mosai pack comes with the unified. Um, there's a hemi uh, post there as well. And when you put on these hemi posts, as I said earlier, all these mosaics, it doesn't add to the heel height. As I said earlier on, if you were giving this orthotic on one side and orthotic without any wedge on the other side, you're giving a, well, I reckon that's about a three mil, four mil heel raise on there. Yeah, if the patient has a leg length difference and, and, and you want to treat it that way, that's fine. But most commonly they aren't. Yeah, and by doing this, it's an added complication to the orthotic, which you really, ideally, you want to avoid. With a bio unified pack, if you don't have a medial axis, so you want to put no rear foot post on, you can. It all comes with that. And that means you can put that wedging on, you can reduce pronation moments, and via the first rate groove, you're not going to impinge on first rate. So whether it be with this total rear foot posting, yeah, this is even a cushion heel pack if you want it on there as well. You can apply those moments optimally without irritating the first rate function. Now, here comes a bit I really like. Um, I've just actually done a video up here in LBG Medical, um, which will be on the LBG Medical Education section soon. Um, and it's the shell is heat moldable. It's a lovely polypropylene and I've been playing with it today. And so it starts off with this console with a first rate groove. But as we know, with things like posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, you might have one arch lower than the other one. And that's where prefabs have fallen down historically um, because you can't, you can't modify the arch height. Yeah, you're stuck with that arch height. You might have to go for a very soft appliance, so one compresses, the other one doesn't, but then you've lost a lot of your supportive mechanism. Uh, what you're going to do with this material is you can take your blowtorch, yeah, and you can warm it, yeah, with a pair of Kevlar gloves on. You can then heat it and you can lower it. You can stand the patient on it, not straight away, it'll be cool, um, and then have a look at how the contour fits the foot. And if you have a plantar exostosis, a plantar navicular area, which is prominent, um, you can actually heat that section more and lower it further and stand them on it again and have a look and lower it further. And so you get a prefab which has been customized you know, to the shape of the patient's foot. Remember, this is a low bulk appliance. It's probably about a one mil thickness at the back. It's a high grade polypropylene. You can heat it, you lower down that section. So right now it looks like you've actually got a patient come in who would, before would have been the patient you would immediately reach the plaster with. Um, say a person with a positive tendon dysfunction on one side and on the other one. It means you can actually put an appliance in their shoe on one side for comfort. You can heat mold it if you want to, but you don't have to probably on that side. It probably fits that average arch height that comes with the, uh, the Unify very well. But on the other side, you can actually heat it, lower it, put a small dell beneath the navicular area in there, check it to the foot, check them standing, walking, check they're comfortable. You then put your mosai on that side. One, two, three, depending how many you want to put on there, up to probably 15 degrees, probably easily. Yep, without raising the heel. 
and you can then put a top cover on as well for comfort or for durability. They will fit into normal footwear because there's only that very small, um, it's a low bulk appliance at the back. You haven't made the heel height higher by putting the posting or wedging on. So when the panel says what's well, different, uh, basically that is. Uh, that's a massive change to, to prefab prescription. And while you're doing that, you have the first rate groove, so you're still not going to impinge on first rate function, even though you have that orthotic in there, which has not been custom made to the shape of the foot. And these additions that come in the pack, the top covers also have a first rate groove in them and they can be adhered by double sided sticky straight on. So it's not the thing where you might have a small groove, put a thick first ray cover on, sorry, sorry, a thick cover on and then impinge on first ray function. These also have a first ray groove made in. And my only issue slightly here is there may not be enough mosaics in each pack, but uh, you know, you wouldn't use a mosaic for every single patient. So you'd have to double up sometimes on packs and just skip for one and save them from one pack to another one. And these are the top covers here. Oh, we have got pictures. Sorry, I should have said on the last slide. You see the pictures here show quite nicely that with the additional first rate groove in the top cover, you get even more of a first rate Dell there. Like so. So the first rate groove on the actual shell itself. And there it is on the top cover. So as you can imagine on there, underneath here, you could have maybe three mosaic stuck on getting 15 degrees. Yeah, maybe nothing on the other side. You made it on both sides, it's fine. So if you look at the Bio Unified, the question is, have we managed to reduce the traditional difficulties with prefab for orthoses? Number one, we've taken away any kind of literature or, or reference to, to historic theories. Um, and by doing so, opening up the clinician yeah, to be able to use whatever one you want to use to make the appliance. If you want to just use tissue stress model, um, there is a straightforward hemi post in there, which is, is similar to a, to a medial heel scythe. Um, but if you want to use a bio unified theory and you want to give an orthotic prescription, uh, modify the orthotic looking at gait and posture as we'd recommend, uh, this is the orthotic for it. We decreased impingement on first rate function by putting the first rate groove not only on the shell, but also on the top cover. We've decreased the limitation of shell shape modification. So remember, you don't need a grinder for these. You don't need glue. Um, all we need here is a, a heat torch and Kevlar gloves. Uh, and then quite simply, all available from the most online stores. Um, and the simple heating, and I say, if you get a chance to look at the video, which will be online soon, um, showing me doing this. And the great thing is you, you can heat it many times. If you heat it once and you haven't got that delve deep enough, you heat it again and lower it again. But it also means you can heat it and return it back to its original shape. Um, and there doesn't be any weakness to the material with that at all. That's supposed for comfort and, of course, use and impingement. You can put large mosaic wedging on there. And by doing the large mosaic wedging, you don't have to actually make that a higher raise in the shoe. It's still a low bulk appliance. We haven't talked about supination moments today, but lateral, that, that hemi post will be stuck laterally as well as medially. As we said above there, you can put multiple wedges on without making it thick in the shoe. And you can heat it for comfort. And the top cover for comfort too. I don't think durability is an issue with these, certainly not with the shell shape modification. So at the moment, it looks like we've taken the issues we've had with past prefab appliances. And these aren't materials that compress, remember, these don't wear down over time. Um, it looks like you managed to reduce or eradicate a lot of the issues which have stopped me using prefabs in the past. Let's do a very quick case presentation, um, then we'll take some questions. So this is a good example of what comes into, into my clinics. Uh, you have someone who is one-sided pronated more than the other one. So here we're talking about that classic presentation of medial ankle pain, has been increasing their activity. This lady was overweight, has using poorly cushioned supportive fashion trainers. Uh, worse with activity, medial ankle swelling, feels the foot rolls down more now, has gone up a shoe size, you know, saying her feet are grown. Uh, Fitbit steps reduced massively. So try to be more active, had this chronic injury, now relatively inactive. Clinical findings, the FPI 6, you know, the foot posture index 6, so it's greater on the right and the left. You can see that on the picture there. Uh, manual muscle testing showed that that right posterior tip of muscle was weaker than the left. Unable to tiptoe stand on the right. Gait demonstrates greater rear foot right inversion. Standing, both SDGAs, the axes were medial, but the right one was more so. But it was still a flexible rear foot and midfoot. 
So it's not a grade three at the moment. Uh, it's a stage 2B, steroidal tendon dysfunctional adult acquired flat foot, depending which one you decide and call it. And the past is sort of foot would normally be, for me in my clinic, an immediate reach for uh, an impression system to take carcinoids foot in different shapes. The left one, as you see, isn't particularly a great foot, might require some reduction of pronation moment, but the, the right one would need a lot more. Now, in the past, that would be done via skies or mosaics. Here in Mosai. So, treatment plan, of course, has multiple interventions here. Yeah, GP, surgery for scanning, etc., etc. But orthotics, as soon as possible, to reduce pronation moments and offload the posterior tibial tendon. Yeah. What would the orthosis prescription be? Well, we can go straight from the bio unified orthosis now. And by doing that, immediately prescribe orthotics for this patient to take away with them. The left would have no modifications possibly on. The right one would have the Mosai additions, and maybe many of them, to get that foot into better posture and get gait to improved. Yeah. The shell on this side would require heating and lowering for comfort, but again, we could ask the patient if they're comfortable, stand them on it, stand them off it, reheat it if you need to. And by doing that, you've immediately issued an orthotic to this patient without waiting. And all the other things you want to add to that, the footwear advice, they can leave the clinic with their bio-unified orthotics to go to the trainer store for your recommended trainers to get the fitted with them in there. It improves the patient treatment when we're in a hurry. I mean, this isn't an emergency, as we know, but it's an urgency thing. The sooner we can treat these feet, the better. And here, I'll actually use this kind of an example in the video, which we uploaded soon, um, probably next week, I think, on the Aboriginal Medical website. Um, and you see how I'd make one of those to fit into that sort of foot and that issue. Right. Thank you very much for joining me today.